you should never be intellectually safe on a college campus, period. Um, the brain is a muscle. It ought to hurt. It ought to burn. I want to stretch it. I want to push you beyond what is comfortable. Trigger, I meant to trigger you. Like that, that's the goal, right? We're pushing you past your comfort zone. Hello, everyone. And um, welcome to DEI training programs. What do they aim for? What should they aim for? a virtual Heterodox Academy event. For those unfamiliar, HXA is a nonpartisan nonprofit organization with more than 5,000 members dedicated to improving research and teaching by promoting open inquiry, viewpoint diversity, and constructive disagreement. Now, often events like these are comprised of big name folks from a handful of the most prestigious institutions. While these conversations can often be interesting and illuminating, they regularly fail to capture the experiences and daily realities of most faculty, administrators, or students around the country. This panel was designed to buck these tendencies and hopefully serve as a model for others to follow. Between myself and, my, uh, and the panelists, we have experience in a range of institutions, from community colleges to land-grant public universities, religious schools, the Ivies, and HBCUs. We hail from a range of backgrounds, both in terms of our academic disciplines and life experiences, and collectively, we've occupied many different institutional roles within colleges and universities. My name is Musa al -Garbi. I'm a Paul F. Lazarsfeld Fellow in Sociology at Columbia University. I'm also the author of a viral series of articles for Heterodox Academy, summarizing the empirical literature on um, DEI trainings, uh, how they typically go awry, and how they could be improved. Um, links to all of the articles in that series and a brief interview on what I'd hope to people to take away from it are all available in the latest episode of HXA's new podcast, Heterodox Out Loud. Because my own thoughts on these questions are publicly available, we won't dwell much on my own take tonight. Instead, the plan is to dedicate as much time as possible towards uh, picking the brains of our esteemed panelists. I'll introduce them now. Rosalyn Artist is the president of Benedict College. She was the first female president to hold that um, position and was previously the first female president of Florida Memorial University. She is a member of the National Board of Directors for the United Negro College Fund, an educational advisor to the US Secretary of Homeland Security, and a member of the President's Advisory Board for Title III Administrators and the Educational Testing Service President's Advisory Council. Joseph Guarnari is an um, academic success advisor at the University of Bridgeport, Previously, he served as the assistant director of the PACT program at Mercy College. He is a regular contributor to the HXA blog and has also written for Times Higher Ed and ARIO. His public facing work and academic research focus on exploring ways that colleges and universities can help students flourish. George Yancey is a sociologist at Baylor University whose work explores ideological diversity, demographic diversity, and the relations between these. He has done extensive work on the, on the religiosity of uh, faculty and their views towards religion. Regarding racial tensions, he has articulated a mutual accountability framework in his 2006 book, Beyond Racial Gridlock, and his 2010 follow-up, Transcending Racial Barriers. He's currently working on a book called Beyond Racial Division, a unifying uh, alternative to colorblindness and anti-racism. Before turning things over to our panelists, let me give you a quick rundown of our plan for this evening. Each of the panelists will begin by offering some introductory remarks on the theme of this panel, exploring the goals of DEI training programs, the extent to which TEI training helps us achieve those goals in practice or not, and what else can or should be done to more effectively move the meter. After our panelists set the stage with their initial remarks, I'll follow up with the panelists on points that stuck out at me or some things that I think we should drill, on, drill in on more. The panelists are also strongly encouraged at this stage to ask their co-panelists questions or to respond to something said in someone else's presentation. And of course, this being Heterodox Academy, panelists are encouraged to not only build on places where their views converge, but also to explore tensions or differences between their perspectives on these issues. Um, so this part of the program will be more conversational in nature. Then we'll open up the floor for uh, audience Q&A. Viewers can submit questions by typing them into the Q&A box um, at the bottom of their screen. When you submit a question, it will be received by our behind the scenes team who will elevate questions for me uh, to ask. 
please feel free to submit questions at any point in the program tonight. Um, that is, you need not wait for the Q&A. If your question or comment is intended for a particular panelist, um, please indicate that in the question. And if they're intended for everybody to chew on together, feel free to indicate that too. As always, we welcome constructive disagreement. So please feel free to ask questions that are challenging so long as they're asked respectfully and in good faith. Without further ado, let's get the conversation started. Uh, Roslyn, I'd like to invite you to go first and share your introductory remarks on tonight's theme. Good evening, and thank you for allowing me to be a part of this important conversation, specifically in my role as an HBCU president. Uh, in many contexts, people believe that historically Black colleges do not have a place in the conversation around diversity, equity, and inclusion. We are presupposed to be environments where there is no issue with diversity. That could not be more inaccurate. The reality is our institutions wrestle with the same context issues that every institution and organization in our nation wrestles with, particularly at this moment in time and this inflection point in our history around diversity, equity, and inclusion. We have an opportunity to be a voice, an instructive voice to many of our corporate peers, to our community partners, and to other institutions in the conversation around diversity, equity, and inclusion. To be sure, diversity, equity, equity and inclusion are not the same things. We do not necessarily achieve them in a linear way. There can be representation without inclusion. We're all very well aware of that. And there can be inclusion without equity. And so training does have a valuable place, but that training has to be based, grounded, and surrounded by a sense of empathy. Intentional empathy is a strategy that we have adopted at Benedict College, which means being purposeful and intentional about placing yourself in another's shoes. I'll give you an example. Recently, our community, the community of Columbia, South Carolina, historically um, a civil war community, uh, one that is deep and rich in its legacy, both in exclusion and more recently in attempts at inclusion. Uh, we completed a comprehensive study with the benefit of the Richland County Library where we uh, interviewed 60 members of the BIPOC community. That is of course, black indigenous people and other people of color uh, to symbolize of course, the importance of the native and indigenous people as well as the unique issues around the black communities. These were comprehensive one-on-one -on -one interviews that really revealed some key learnings. Um, the first, obviously, is that culture remains to be the key. Um, presidents, leaders, CEOs, executives truly set the tone. However, the mid-level managers and supervisors are the critical gatekeepers on matters of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so training and development in intentional empathy is critically important. Transparency around leadership is equally important. People need to understand where the goalpost is. What is the opportunity for advancement and how do I get there? What is the roadmap and what are the rules of engagement? Clear communication and transparency go a long way and that can be taught, that can be trained, that can be embraced. Problematic perceptions on location, we are in the South. There are obvious uh, perceptions that attach to being in South Carolina where we only recently retired uh, the Confederate flag for example. And so being able to unpack and engage in conversations around um, racial identity and uh, commitment to diversity, equity and inclusion are very, very important. Mentorship, important lesson, mentorship is more important than representation. So as an, at the outset, I said, diversity, equity, inclusion are not necessarily all the same. They're certainly not linear. What we know from our engagement on the college campus and certainly in our employer community is you can meet a number. You can admit a class that is diverse. You can hire employees that are diverse. But if they are not mentored, supported, engaged, and truly included, they will not be successful. And so I do believe uh, robust training opportunities really give rise to um, a mentoring environment, an engaged environment where people can matter in a very real way. Um, representation still matters, but certainly inclusion and, men and mentorship really matter more. Unpacking questions of can I be myself? That means do I have to straighten my hair to fit in? Do I have to speak using your vernacular to fit in? Or is there room for me and my unique identity? And being honest uh, and avoiding um, assuming that you know better than the other person, what they need, want, desire, what their lived experiences are, are critically important. And finally, hearing 
my voice. And I know Heterodox Academy believes deeply in that. Hearing people in their individual and unique voice, place, and space, allowing people the freedom of expression and engagement to be a part of the genuine conversation around issues of race, sex, diversity, engagement, and inclusion are critically important. Uh, do the training programs always meet the mark? No. And they don't because most do not start with human-centered design. They do not go directly to the end user and find out what is it we can do for you to feel more comfortable, engaged, included. Certainly there is some active behavior, but there's also some passive slash passive aggressive behavior that tends to attach. And so I think using um, a human centered design where people are at the heart of the conversation rather than um, as an afterthought. Uh, we can go a long way toward meaningful diversity, equity, inclusion, both on our college campuses, whether they be HBCU or predominantly white institutions or Hispanic serving institutions or the other alphabet, um, and certainly in our workplaces and our communities. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, uh, Rustin, for, okay, lots to dig in there. We'll be very excited to do that in the next uh, phrase, uh, phase. Um, but in the meantime, um, let's turn things over to, to Joseph. Absolutely. Good evening, everyone. And I'm, um, I just want to say I'm, I'm like, like, I'm very fortunate to bring uh, the, the, the administrative um, pers perspective um, into this, this, like, this, uh, this conversation, because a lot of the, um, the discussion around DEI programs in a kind of like, roundabout way begins and ends with us a lot of the time. Um, so overall, what do they aim for um, and what sh should they aim for? So um, it's a pretty uh, like widely known like, like, like fact at this point. Um, higher education is the most div diverse um, it's ever been on um, pretty much every metric you can, like, can look into. Um, and this is like referring, you know, both to under uh, un underrepresented like, like racial groups. Um, it refers to the LGBTQ community, um, and so the DEI like program is kind of a response to this. Um, this actually really like 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 rapid um, like diverse diverse diversification um, because they're um, they're pretty much an, an attempt to get up to to speed an institution that was historically like white um, historically like wealthy um, up until like you know the mid like 20th like, century um, and so this is absolutely necessary like we absolutely need this within like higher education as um, a place of of like learning and as a place for cultural conversation and cultural like 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 change and the typical DEI program explores that whole like history um, and then it typically goes on to outline strategies that um, that faculty staff and students and students can utilize to um, to reduce like racism, homophobia, like sexism, like, like etc. On campus, um, and again, all of that's like, like like wonderful. The issue that I see um, a lot of the times is that these 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 DEI pro programs. Um, divide like students, like, like like staff, like faculty. They divide them up based on outward um, like appearance, based on like somewhat like like loose like identity characteristics, um, such as like like race, like sexual sexual orientation, like things like that, which are all again important, but they don't tell the entire like story. Um, you can't define um, like an in, like an individual's like um, identity based off like like of those outward um, like identity characteristics alone. It's um, it's impossible. And on top of that, what a lot of people don't 
realize too is that like DEI programs are not only ped ped pedagogical. Although they intend to educate, they intend um, to influence behavior on campus. They're, they're also like, 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 like looking to, to influence um, it's institutional goals like retention, persistence, student like academic success. There are people who take part in those programs um, like who don't necessarily like, like notice um, that always. And it's uncomfortable to admit too, but uh, but those specific like, like metrics all have financial ends. And so for, 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 uh, for the majority of, institu of institutions that rely on um, on to, on to, to, on tuition, like, like to keep um, to keep the, the like, lights on, things like persistence, things like retention, and academic like success, um, directly influence like the institution like bottom like bottom like, uh, line um, a lot of the times, and so the issue with all of that is that as of right like now the current like research. Um, that we have, like, tells us that DEI programs, while they're they're very like well intentioned, um, they they really like don't bring like student staff and and faculty uh, together. And there's um, like there's like like countless like studies on this. Like like Musa, you've written on them. Um, it, like there is no proof that it's actually connecting all of us. So that's like, like, prob like, like number one, the problem is actually twofold because like, not only um, are we like, are we not succeeding in connecting everyone? There's also evidence that it can actually bring people apart in a lot of, um, in a lot of like, uh, like, like a different, like, like of different ways. And because it, inf it's supposed to influence like things like retention, persistence and academics, like success, like um, in some like ways, these programs actually have the opportunity to hurt the institutional like bottom, like bottom, like, like bottom like line in that case. And so I think where these programs should be um, like trying to um, to improve is how they like look at 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 diversity like rather than only looking at um, at outward like appearance and kind of like like loose identity characteristics they should aim to keep in mind the hundreds of other like uh, uh, like things th that allow us, particularly st students, um, to uh, to formulate an identity. So, like career and artistic passions, like family value, socioeconomic, like like status, personal hardship, like like, like disability, like um, like physical, and like learning, uh, like things like things like that. They should be trying to. And to to incorporate all of this um, in an attempt to to find like similarities between us, um, as opposed to just divide us into to loose groups that don't tell an entire like story. Um, and so I, I like I think the 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 future of DEI like programs like really is in um, like. Like, like changing them so that they 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 focus um, entirely on like what we all like share our common humanity um, and I think that students and staff and 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 professors also have a certain like hunger for, like, for that like more um, than we actually like realize as of right now Absolutely. Uh, well, okay. So uh, first, you can already see some interesting threads building between uh, Rosalind's presentation and Joe's. Uh, 
But to close us out on this um, on this section of the night, let's have George uh, take us home, and then we can have a conversation together. Okay, thanks, Mustafa. Mr. Uh, I, you know, first I really appreciate the work you've done as far as uh, look at the research concerning diversity programs, uh, DEI programs, and uh, their shortcomings. And I think it's fair to say that, generally speaking, that they're, they're not delivering what we want them to deliver. <clears throat> so I really want to approach this as much as possible academically. And look what research says, what works and what doesn't work, because I feel that doing that can give us more direction as to where we should go. So uh, I'm not going to go into uh, a lot into the uh, some of the issues that have come up. I mean, Musa's done a great job of documenting that. What I will say is, a lot of times what's done in some of these programs, and some, you know, there are some that work and some that don't work, goes counter to what we are we know. For example, talking about privilege. There's a couple of studies out there that show that talking about privilege does not convince concert, more conservative individuals to be more sympathetic and actually has the potential of a backlash. So, you know, talking about privilege, microaggressions has not shown to be very, very useful. Uh, these things have not worked. So we have to ask the question, what does work? To help me to understand this, I've been thinking about how we get people to do things or to, cons or to change their perspectives. And to a large extent, it becomes power versus moral suasion. And what I mean by power is, power is whenever someone does something because other people are pressuring them to do that. So power can be physical power, obviously, uh, but it could be social power, cultural power, legal power, political power. And I think one problem we have is at least some diversity training is based on power. We're gonna mandatory have you here and we're going to you know, use our institutional power in order to get you to do certain, certain things or say you believe certain things. Now there's a time you need power. I have three kids, six, four, and two. So sometimes you have to tell the kids, no, you cannot have cookie until you eat your vegetables. But power brings its own problems. Uh, it doesn't create lasting change, first off. If I'm doing something because people have power over me, then when they don't have power over me, then I go back to what I'm doing. It's why I don't make my bed up anymore. My mom had power over me when I was a kid. Now she doesn't, so I don't make my bed anymore. I was never convinced that was really that important. It also carries the possibility of abuse because if you get something with power, then you're tempted to continue to use power to keep getting it. So what I really like is the research on, on persuasion, moral suasion. And it gets a bad knock because people think of moral suasion as someone forced to do what they want through power. But that's not what real moral suasion is. And what the research on moral suasion suggests is that we convince people by building rapport by finding an agreement, by understanding the perspectives of others, by acknowledging uh, their fears. In other words, when you think about it, when someone doesn't use power to convince you, but persuades you, they develop a relationship with you, they've developed a connection with you, and then you're open to, ch to ch actually change your perspective. And if that person goes away, then that change is still there. So one of the directions I'd like to see these programs go is thinking about moral suasion. And while I'm on the topic of moral suasion, let me just say that moral suasion is the opposite of internet activism. It's the opposite of, of, of the so-called Twitter mob. Because with what that does, that sort of activism does is power. I'm not going to say this again because I'm gonna get everyone jumping all over me, but my mind is not changed and then I'm gonna go vote for Trump. So moral suasion is not that sort of pressure from internet activism. It's once again, building rapport, finding agreement, understanding perspectives of others. And I would argue that moral suasion can build community instead of polarization. And one of these we want on our campuses is more of a community. Now I realize that's difficult when you have a very large campus. I got my doctorate at University of Texas at Austin, 50,000 students, that's a large community. 
So you're not gonna be able to always build this community. If you have a small campus, that's one thing, but a large campus, you can't. But you can build a sense community. And that comes through moral suasion. That comes from finding ways so we can connect with others and do so in a respectful manner that then allows them to, for them to come to the moral conclusion of what is right and how they act, how they treat others with respect, how they, how they have tolerance, how they work towards inclusion, how they do the things that we hope for them to do. It's tempting not to use moral suasion because we know with power, we can get instant, you know, instantly we can get them to do what we want. And that's why sometimes you use power. I use power on my kids, so I tell them not to run in the street because I want them instantly to stop. If I'm telling them that they're 19, then I've done something wrong. So, but moral suasion has this long-term consequence. So what does this mean in more practical terms? And what does the research on DEI says? Well, the research of DEI says that developing skills and learning perspective taking, th that is a more effective technique than, than merely teaching. So one of the features I would like to say DEI is engage in is to teach the perspectives of you know, learn how to take the perspectives of others, learn how to understand where other people are coming from. Uh, and that's been well documented as, as being effective. I would also like to see discussion groups, but done in a way where people have freedom to enunciate their perspectives. And we teach people how to have these discussions with others, how to engage in active listening, how to communicate with others in ways that can hear you, that this can be done, that we can teach people how to have healthy discussions and then do discussion groups. One of the things when I did research on crossing colleges and diversity, one of the things I found that was effective in retention and uh, um, students of color so they would go on and get a degree was when they had professors, uh, a lot of times professors of color, but not always, who led discussions in classes where they can discuss their issues out. And when they had multiracial groups, where once again, they had an opportunity to discuss these issues out. And that fits into what, how moral suasion would, uh, would fit. I believe the community building will lead to healthier race relations and reduce racial conflict. We're never gonna totally end racial conflict, we know this, but we can have healthy race relations. So when situations come up, we're in a position to talk to one another about it and not talk past each other about it. And the people in our colleges are the future leaders of our society. If they learn how to talk to each other and not pass each other, our society will be better off 10, 20, 30 years ago when they take the reins of power. One final thing I would just like to say, and uh, I think you know this is in agreement uh, with, with the other speakers, I think we need to think about more globalized principles than attention to selected groups. Uh, some of our research is on hostility towards conservative Christians. And you know, I can, I can demonstrate uh, that uh, conservative Christians actually are rejected more than some of the groups that we traditionally think about uh, rejected on college campuses. I'm talking about on college campuses, I'm talking about society-wise. So what we have to do is let's not just focus on how we, how we take care of this group but how do we as individuals develop the, uh, the skills of the morality so that we learn how to include others, even people we don't agree with, and how we can include them in our lives, even though we can't always work with the, their aims and goals, but still we can create a place for them, uh, no matter who they are. The person that I disagree with, how do I work with them? Because uh, it's easy to work with people I already agree with. So I would like to see you know, us concentrating on more globalized principles rather than teaching, we're gonna learn how to accept this particular group. I think that we'd be much better off in skill development if we do that. And so with that, I'll turn it back over and uh, await any questions. Great, um, so I guess, uh, so now we're gonna move to something that's a, a more sort of conversational between us. Um, so so you know, feel free to unmute or jump in sort of anytime. Um, one thing that I, you know, one thing that struck me that came out in Joe's comments and also um, Rosalind's comments, and that I think is maybe a good starting point to, to sort of ruminate on a bit together, is that it seems clear 
that, as you guys noted, that DEI training programs are supposed to serve like this whole range of purposes, right? Um, so for some, some comp uh, companies and institutions are worried about preventing lawsuits. Um, some are worried about retaining um, uh, students and faculty and other employees, um, increasing uh, productivity or GPA or, you know, to, to help people flourish better and succeed more in the institutions. Um, to show that to different stakeholders that you share a certain set of values, um, sometimes to attract certain employees or students or to um, or donations or things like that um, to help rectify uh, or help mitigate um, injustices and prejudice um, and inequalities within institutions. So I guess the, the question um, that I have is, I guess twofold, the, that struck me as I was listening to you. I guess one, first, I guess, especially for Rosalind and Joe who are like um, really involved in this work um, in a, in a, how do you, how do you guys, as you're approaching your work, how do you think about balancing these competing priorities um, to the extent that they're intention? I mean, oftentimes they travel together, but sometimes they come apart. So how do you guys think about sort of balancing these different priorities? And then um, I guess, do you, got, do, you, do you all share the sensibility that maybe these programs are, are almost trying to carry too much weight, like they're trying to do too much. And in which, in which case, what do you think would be the sort of core things that they should really, um, you know, which, which kinds of goals do you think should be left off for something else <laughs> rather than trying to promote those goals through diversity training? Um, so I can definitely uh, start, sorry, Raz. <laughs> um, so um, in terms of, of like balancing, uh, the goals like and the outcomes of them, I think it should depend on the arena um, that you're acting in. So for, for, for example, like in my own case on the admin, like student um, affairs end, we should pr probably like, like focus on two things, like in, um, in, 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 in inclusion on the one hand, as an educational goal for the 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 students like 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 involved, and our actions and like programs and and initiatives related to students should pretty much only center um, like around that. But at the same time, we can like utilize all um, of those initiatives to support the institutional like, like goals of, of persistence, retention, like an academic success on our own. So in our case, um, again, like, like, like our concern is, is totally different depending on who like we're attempting um, to educate. If you're educating like like students, your 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 you're essentially trying to bring them together, and then keep them like like together. But then, when we're back, you know, in our offices and our uh, like departments, like hashing out like 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 retention numbers, at that point, we can um, can can say how are these initiatives like relating to that. So I think it's like, again, totally possible to like to do like multiple uh, um, things at the same time, but you have to kind of be, be smart, like, like in my, like in my opinion, as to like where you're attempting to influence each of the goals. So, and I would tend to agree with Joseph in that, but do want to pick back up on George's point in terms of, I think you can't, you know, Martin Luther King, right? We can't legislate morality. Um, we cannot um, compel, but we can have conversation, right? We cannot change your opinion. Um, and that's really moral persuasion in a nutshell, right? We are going to have conversations with you that bring you closer to an equilibrium where you can accept and appreciate multiple points of views and perspectives without coercion, 
right? We're not gonna use our position authority or power. I'm not going to mandate my faculty show up on this day, on this time, at this time and hear a lecture, right? I, I think that defies logic and certainly flies in the face of what we're really trying to accomplish. And that is to create an environment where uh, multiple views can be expressed um, while I hate the notion of safe space, um, I will be a pain in the butt on that one. You should never be intellectually safe on a college campus, period. Um, the brain is a muscle. It ought to hurt. It ought to burn. I want to stretch it. I want to push you beyond what is comfortable. Trigger, I meant to trigger you. Like that, that's the goal, right? We we're pushing you past your comfort zone. And so I, I do not go so far as to suggest that we should create these insulated safe spaces. Quite to the contrary. So as an HBCU, um, we had to have the Trump conversation. You know, Benedict was trumped. Now that may be morally repugnant to a whole bunch of people, but the fact is um, we found ourselves in a situation where the then leader of the free world decided he was gonna show up on an HBCU campus. And so the backlash for me, as you might imagine, was swift and loud. And so as we talk about the Twitter trolls and the you know bullies, the internet bullies, right? Um, conversations around how dare you allow him to tread on ground that was once a slave plantation. Well, now let's unpack that for a second. If we if we limited him to governing from areas that were no that were not historically slave plantations, he would have had to govern from Air Force One east of the Mississippi. More importantly, had it been anything other than HBCU, you wouldn't be asking me that question. Um, why are my students? Uh, not capable of discerning multiple opinions, viewpoints, political perspectives in an intelligent way, distilling and disaggregating those ideas. So the audience matters. We had great conversations with students about why it matters to juxtapose multiple conversations. The backlash came, right, from the adults, from the community, from the politicians, from the faculty to some extent. And so there are differing strategies depending on the population, but they certainly always begin with a conversation, which is why I raised the study in my earlier comments, um, they didn't begin with teaching you how to be. They began with listening to better understand the perspectives and lived experiences of those individuals who find themselves on the outs of the majority. And so when you ask questions about their lived experiences and they say things like, I change my hair before I go to work because there's going to be a supervisor there and I don't want to look the wrong way. Okay, flip that using intentional empathy you are white, your hair is fine and blonde and the CEO's, and now the world is different. It's curly and brown and you are the outlier. You are the one who's different. How much heat, how much chemical, how much money, how much sleep will you give up to transform your um, personal appearance to meet society's needs? Through empathy, engagement, um, and this sort of switching of roles, we can engage in meaningful conversations and help push us closer toward um, that understanding place in the middle. And so I, I do, I think we've used the term training loosely, right? Experiential learning is really what this is. Um, it's fundamentally experiential learning. Do you think that there's a tension? Hmm. One tension that I see sometimes is because I've seen both, like, um, so you both, actually all all of the panelists have articulated a, a vision of trying to help people take other people's perspectives or walk in their shoes or kind of try to see things the way that they see them. But at the same time, there's a, a current of thought that expresses itself in various forums that basically runs that you can't really ever truly understand what it's like to be something other than your own group. And that if you presume to do so, if you presume to, to know what it is, like if you're a white person, for instance, if you presume to know what it's like to be a person of color, or if you're a man and you presume to know, know what it's like to be a woman, et cetera, et cetera, that there's something arrogant and sort of deeply and morally problematic about that as well. And that also doesn't seem crazy. <laughs> but so so how, do you, how do you strike, um, you know, how, what's the good, what's a good balance there? Like, how can we, how can we kind of um, work through that sort of pull um, between, on the one hand, recognizing that there are limits to our ability to fully understand someone else's experience, but on the other hand, nonetheless, trying to, to really, as best we can, right, understand how someone else sees the world or what someone else is going through. Well, I would say it's kind of even worse than that, in that I'm an African-American, but how being African-American has affected me 
is not exactly the way how being African American affected other African Americans. So when another African American says, "Well, I know how you how you how you feel because you're black," yes and no. There are, there are certain elements that are common, but I the way I've experienced my blackness, you know, is unique to the situation that I have been in. So right, we cannot ever say, well, I completely understand where you're coming from. For me, that does not take away the responsibility of getting closer to understanding so that I can learn how to communicate with you, so that I can learn how to imp imp emphasize, emphasize, empathize with you, you know what I'm trying to say, uh, that, I, you know, so we can connect as humans. So I, I understand that I will, you know, I will never fully where, I mean, it's, as social scientists, when we say groups, when we say groups that we're not, uh, what are we trying to do? We're trying to understand them. We know we're not them. So anytime you say a group that you are not, then you're trying your best to understand them, knowing you're never going to completely get there. And so we, we take mechanisms in order to try to get as close as possible. We interview them. We ask, you know, we sometimes ask them, have I captured, you know, your sentiment completely? Uh, and, and, and we work towards that. I think to some degree, that's what we want people to do, uh, to, to try to get closer knowing that we're not gonna put there. So you never say something like, well, you know, I know how you feel, I know how you feel as a black person when you're white. And really, you shouldn't say, you know how you feel as a black person if you're black, because you don't know how I feel as a black person. You can guess and you can get closer perhaps if you're black, but you really don't know. But you can empathize, emphasize, I can't say the word, you can sympathize, <laughs> I'll just say go sympathy, okay? Can sympathize with where I'm coming from. And to me, that's okay. You can get to that point because then, you know, you treat me as human and, and not as something less than human. Yeah, I mean, so this is one of the things that struck me in, in, in Rosalind's remarks, actually her, in her opening point about HBCUs and how people think that a historically black college or university would have to grapple with a lot of the same kinds of tensions around DEI, but in fact, they do, right? And so how can we, um, and so this is a, another great question, um, another great sort of, how, how can we better surface this, this diversity within groups, this diversity of perspectives, of experiences, of challenges, of uh, viewpoints within groups, not just across groups? Right. So I, I don't know that the answer is different. So I am a graduate of a historically black college. However, I was raised in Southern West Virginia, which is a 3% minority state. Uh, it was when I grew up there and it still is today. They work really hard to keep it that way. But um, as a result of that, um, and I'm, I'm biracial. So my mother is white, my father's black. So I grew up in a household. I, I never tasted a grit. I don't understand the colloquialisms. There was no soul food in my house. Um, I didn't learn to cook those cuisines that are most consistent with my supposed identity. Um, and I had all white classmates. I went to school with all white people. And as a result of that, um, I attended an HBCU almost by accident. Didn't know what uh, the acronym stood for. I was trying to get to college and I got a scholarship letter and we're off to college. It was that or the army, right? So um, I went. And so for me, where people publicly always say, HBCUs allow you to be yourself. Students can come on the campuses of HBCUs to be, to, to be their uh, authentic selves. No, for me, going to an HBCU taught me who myself was, right? I, I didn't have any experience with blackness. My experience was very different. My lived experience, to George's point, looked very different than many of the students who hail from, uh, you know, I've, I've been the president of Miami. Those kids are urban. Um, very, um, then multiple lived experiences I can't appreciate. Uh, I remember standing on the campus one day and there was gunfire in Miami, shocker. And my communications VP said, Madam President, I need you to step inside. We have gunfire and we can't isolate the source. I need you to get away from the windows. And I was so baffled. I'd never heard gunfire in Southern West Virginia outside of a hunting rifle. I, I had no context for it. I didn't understand that culture. I've now come to South Carolina where rural African-Americans look very different than the urban eclectic mix of people in Miami. And so between and among, betwixt and between, we're all grappling with those same issues of identity and the complexities associated therewith. And at the end of the day, the goal is not just live and let live, but live and appreciate those distinctions and differences and be open enough or um, 
broad enough in your thinking to allow room for different perspectives. I don't reflect the lived experiences of many of the students that I serve. I can identify and empathize with them to some extent, but that has not been my lived experience. And so I think we all have to be very honest, intellectually and emotionally honest about who we are and what the limitations are in our human frailties and capacities to deal with difference and to resist the temptation um, to create fictions about groups of people or, I mean, listen, um, to, I, I can say this because we're virtual. If I were in public, I wouldn't dare say this because somebody would hit me with a tomato. There are good people on both sides of this, um, right? Mm -hmm. uh, now we hate that, that, yeah, that uh, statement and the connotation and we know what it refers to, but in many respects, it's true, right? There are decent people who don't believe what we believe for all sorts of reasons. We're doing a biblical study on our campus. Um, there are many white people who believe that God said unequivocally that we are inferior, we're ham. This blackness is a curse. They believe there's biblical evidence that their racism is affirmed. How do you unpack that, right? Um, and so I think we have to be committed to intellectual exploration. We have to be committed to ongoing conversations and we have to enter from a place of empathy and um, the notion that we have more alike than we are different. Yeah. Well, I can, I can actually like, connect with what um, you said earlier about like not always being able um, to understand uh, the experiences of students um, who you may be working with. Like the same goes like for me. I've worked at two highly like like diverse um, it's like institutions. And was I able at first to understand the experiences of every like student I've ever advised? Absolutely not. That's impossible. But what we can do is we can come to understand like like that experience so, so while we we may not be able to in, to in, to inherently like empathize we can come to like can that um like relates again to to focusing on 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 similarities as opposed to differences because once you have like a few things in common with a specific like like a student colleague like immediately like it's easier to connect it opens up like the conversation and then you're able to learn through th through that 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 connection like more th than you would be able to if you said I'm part of this group, you're part of that group, and that's it. Absolutely. I mean, well, and, and so one thing that that strikes, two things actually that strike me as you, okay, so the first is that it seems like the sequencing matters, right? And, and like, uh, and, and you see this in some of the research too, that if you build, if you focus on superordinate identities and things that people have in common first, build that common ground first, then it becomes easier to dig into the differences, you know. Whereas if you start with by elevating or making salient what's different first, then it gets very hard to to get to the common ground later. Um, uh, and another thing that strikes me is the um, the relational nature of it. So you were, I mean, you, you're talking about sort of building relationships with the people you're advising over time, or and in a lot of these communities as well. Whether we're talking about faculty or students um, or administrators, we're talking about relationships that sort of persist over the course of years. You know, over the course of an entire student's career or over the course of a faculty's career at a, at a university. Um, and I guess this get, this gets me thinking. Do you think that sometimes some of these approaches to DEI are maybe um, too focused on quick fixes. So too, too, almost too short thinking or too, you know, come in for an hour, come in for a series of sessions and then that'll do something to, right? As opposed to something more long-term. And this strikes me too, as it relates to, to Rosalind and um, George's points about power, because when when you're looking for a quick fix, um, that's you're you're more likely to sort of reach if you have power available to you to sort of achieve something quickly, right? Um, then you know you'll, you'll, you're more inclined to use power to achieve that goal. Um, I guess what what do you guys think about about 
any of that. <laughs> the, the power aspect, the relational aspect, the elevating similarities first versus differences later, any of those. Yeah, I'll, I'll go on. Uh, you know, there is a time where you need power. For example, I mean, if you're dealing with someone who is actually harassing people, racially, sexually, like that, you know, the university has to step in with power and deal with that situation right then and there. Just like with my kids, I have to use power so they don't run out to the street because I don't want them squashed by a car. I have no problem using power. I have in my, in my lifetime at least two times broken up fights because I am a six foot three black guy and when I waddled into these guys fighting, they decided they didn't want to fight any longer. I used power because there, that was the immediate situation that was needed. So this is not to say that power is never necessary, but think about those situations. I have to teach my kids eventually, and they're, they're catching on, there's a reason why they run into the streets, it's dangerous, and so they stop doing it. They morally start doing that. You know, the, the people who are fighting, eventually, if we have them, you know, they're gonna go fight somewhere else unless something can, someone convinces them that this is not the right sort of lifestyle to have. And that harasser, you can kick them out of the university and you may need to, and you may need to, but they're not changed. And so they're gonna go on and harass someone else. So while there's a, there are times where we have to use power and we have to be wise in when we use power. We are better off if we put the energy towards moral suasion when we can do that. If we want someone to not just stop doing something, but to be convinced that this is what they should stop doing, that's when the longer term principles of moral suasion become important. So, you know, it, it's a balance. And, and, uh, and I, I've never said that uh, you, we can't use power in any situation. I think there are situations where we do need to use power. But what we want to do is, and this is something that I'm juggling with as a father and as a professor and as, as anything that I have authority, how little power can I truly use? Because the, the less power I can use, the more this person is going to, and the research shows this, the more, reason, the more this person is going to accept these values that I'm teaching. So, uh, so that, that's how I try to balance, and, and each situation is unique. So I, you know, I can't give you an answer for all situations, but each of them are going to be unique. So, so I completely agree with everything you said intellectually, but just to be a jerk, I would offer that. Um, so the, in the absence of power, you need patience. And um, from this perspective of a black person, well, it's only been, since 16, 19, hell, how much longer is it going to take? I mean, so it's, I mean, there is a sense of urgency. Um, you know, our, our, our country ebbs and flows. There are moments, this is, you know, everybody says, you know, movement, not moment, that kind of thing. We are at an inflection point, as I mentioned in my earlier comments. And so I do think there is going to have to be some balance of power and persuasion. Um, to accelerate our progress to some extent, because what you are seeing in younger generations, at least in my lived experience, working with 18 to 21 year olds, particularly 18 to 21 year olds of color, is that there is decreasing patience um, for this process. Um, they want to equity right now. <laughs> um, they, they really um, have been raised differently perhaps by many of us, uh, to expect to be treated slightly differently than perhaps past generations have. And so this how long, not long conversation um, does require us to be thoughtful about ways to accelerate progress. Again, completely understand and appreciate forcing your children to do something because I said so, rather than helping them to understand why it's critically important that they do so, or helping them get to that point where they make that decision on their own, by far the better solution. And yet I do sense a growing impatience uh, within the country. Uh, we've certainly seen, seen the expression of that in recent years and it is incumbent upon us to find ways to accelerate this progress. Um, and so again, I tend to be a proponent of these DE&I initiatives. While I hate this notion of training you how to be, how to behave, um, something has to happen. There have to begin to be some structured conversations around concepts of equity and inclusion um, because waiting for people to get there on their own could take 10 more generations based on our, our country's history. And I, to, to, to be honest, I don't think that in, um, that that's, that's, that sense of 
patients is completely on like uh, the current college age like generation. I see it in my own like generation and we're like we were like just the like the college age like generation not too long um, ago at all and and when I see people you know around like my age and my generation who are often like planning a lot of these DEI programs it tends to to come off as though if we do like a once a month like training we're doing our part to combat all of this and I don't like I don't like like think that the 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 trainings on their own are are like are like nearly enough um I think we need to to like to like focus our attention towards areas of any any quality that um, that these programs like typically don't like like worry about often so um, any quality within like like within like admissions within career outcomes like graduation rates like things like that there's any there's there's inequities within all of that and I think we need to discuss all like all of that too like more than just like once a month um or like or even once a um a term i've said quite often um that because we're surrounded by by scholars like like student affairs admins like need to work to become like scholars in their own right and with their own work so we should be like 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 reading we should be like learning and engaging in all of these um like in these like topics and the the most contentious like debates like just the way like faculty tend to just the way upper level like uh administration like like tends to because this is not the kind of like of like of like thing you can you can have an impact in by only like working on it like like once a month. Um, oh, go ahead, Russell. Did, oh, okay. Yes. Well, now I, I think we'll, we'll we'll take a pause and a pivot, and we'll sort of open things up for uh, audience Q and A. I see we have a a pretty good list of um, questions um, popping up, and so I want to be able to um, have us uh, delve into as many of them as we can uh, while we have the time. Um, so one of them that um, stands out that, that sort of relates to points that both George and Rosalind have made at a couple of points. Um, should DEI programs ever be mandatory um, for any groups on campuses? If so, under what circumstances? So this relates to the questions about power and coercion and having people enter the training with the right sort of mindset to learn from it. So what do you, what do you all think? So, so from the perspective of the president, the short answer is yes, um, because we would be preaching to the choir 100% of the time if there were never opportunities for us to engage the campus community in an almost compulsory fashion. Um, it's no different than, I mean, Title IX is a very significant issue right now. We have to mandate that student affairs professionals be well-versed in issues of Title IX. That may not be your cup of tea, but it is a bona fide occupational qualification right now, as is a bare level, a bare minimum level of tolerance for other humans. And so I think there are opportunities, um, whether it's employee orientation and onboarding or welcome week or whatever the heck it is you do on your campuses where we really should. Um, it may not be um, an intentional compulsory, here's what you will do, but certainly opportunities for, again, uh, development of ideas and exchanges, et cetera. I guess I would answer that question by uh, trying to understand what we are doing with the, D, the DEI. Uh, and depending on that would be my answer. Uh, my sense is that uh, we should make it as compulsory as less as possible. Now, you know, Robin brings up a great point. There may be certain teachings that you have to teach uh, just for legal reasons, things like that. Uh, the government's force you, you know. But, I'm, I'm really moved by the research done by Dobbins. I know he's going to be on the panel next week. 
And uh, he shows that mandatory types of diversity training is not correlated with an increased hiring of people of color as managers. What is correlated is uh, taking the managers there who are mostly white and having them become mentors, having them lead up diversity programs, having them lead up recruiting, which impresses upon me that what we should be trying to do is find ways to take people from different groups and have them work together to work towards diversity, to be as inclusive as possible for bringing people into the conversation on how can we create a more inclusive, welcoming campus for everyone. Uh, and the, the result is, you know, companies that did this actually had five years later, more managers, and I, I kind of hate saying this because you're gonna have a guy next week and he'll, he can tell you all about the research. I just read it and, you know, and, 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 and make well interpretations of it. He'll, he'll probably correct me. Uh, but you will actually have companies that are more diverse if you bring people in and the sort of the mandatory stuff was not correlated with that. So I can't say you don't have any mandatory stuff because there may be issues that you just have to do. What I will say is I think it should be as less as possible. That's where I will stand. Yeah, what the research showed the, um, from Dobbin and, and others is that sometimes the mandatory training um, creates blowback because people go into it in the wrong, wrong mindset. They go into it resentful, they go into it hostile. And so they're not really able to learn what you're trying to teach them. Um, and, um, and so there have been some, there's been some work that suggests that trying to offer people incentives to do it. So, so not just saying only the people who, who want to do it should do it, but like trying to offer institutional incentives to encourage people that, uh, to opt in um, rather than forcing them to opt in um, can sometimes allow you to get high rates of participation or higher rates of participation, but without some of the downsides of um, the mandatory uh, mandatory stuff. Um, uh, okay, let me ask another question here. Um, yeah, um, there's evidence, um, there's pretty clear evidence that Christians, conservatives, uh, pro-life people, et cetera, are underrepresented, especially in the professoriate, and um, often experience open hostility on campus. Does that specific form of underrepresentation or hostility, so along the lines of religion or ideology or political affiliation, um, matter for DEI initiatives? And if so, how does it matter? Okay, I, I guess I'll take the lead on this one since I've done the research on this. Uh, yeah, I mean, according to the study that I have, when, uh, when, people are, when, when academics are told that a candidate is a uh, evangelical or fundamentalist, they are less likely to be willing to hire them than they, and they're told if they're, say, Muslim or atheist or, or, or gay and lesbian or, or almost anything. So, uh, so yeah, so it's true that, you know, there's, and there's other research out there, so there is a bias. And I would approach that like I would approach other diversity issues. I, I would not want some sort of mandatory training for people on this. Uh, I'm going to stick to my guns. I think that what we want to do is bring people in to a conversation as to how we create a better atmosphere. There's also some interesting stuff from, uh, I think, your Colorado system that looked at students and showed how a couple of them were on campus. And they didn't do a good job of, of defining a religiosity. They just had general Protestants and Catholics, which there's all sorts of problems that we'll go into. But even, even there, even with that poor of a job, they found that you know, a good chunk of students who are Christians or religious feel uncomfortable on campus in numbers that rival some of the traditional marginalized groups. So uh, I would I would look at diverse training that teaches people tolerance globally, uh, no matter what group, how to how could inclusion globally. And I would uh, say the same thing, you know, bring people in, uh, bring people in to, to talk about the issues, to, to have discussions and how can we find answers if, if we recognize this as a problem. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's the direction I would go. And so that, um, like, like, so that under, under, representation, um, particularly, particularly with regard to, to conservatives. I'm not sure if there's any like, like research about like religion, but with regard to, to conservatives is actually um, uh, the case among 
admins also. Uh, professor like Samuel um, Abrams, uh, who has like written for HXA and um, another um, in other capacities, um, he's written on this. He's like he's like like researched this, um, and that's a like a a reality also um, like on the admin side. And I think it it just like it goes it goes back to including like like viewpoint diversity along along like side like these other types of of diversity and and helping individuals whether like staff like like students or faculty to understand like 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 um like why the multiple types of diversity are are important like like in their respective areas um and how like diversity connects to like learning so there's a like a million like studies out there um a researcher in in higher education uh by the name of george ku um the last name um is spelled uh k-u-h if you want to like look him up but he's done like research connecting the different types of of, of diversity to to like learning outcomes and so i think that we need to keep like the different types of 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 uh, diversity in like in mind here because they are all important like towards the educational goal that we often like uh, look uh, to aim for um what do you think uh Russell, do you have anything you want to jump in there well, I actually i'm sort of processing it i think that too um I i'm gonna let you stand <laughs> i think i'm gonna let you stand Joseph. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I have a question here that's directed at uh, George. Um, I very much, but also actually, as you'll see, it's very clear um, for Rosalind too and her, her and what she explained about her experience with Trump on the campus. Okay, I very much ex appreciated the discussion of moral suasion, and I completely understand and agree with the argument about communication and discussion being more effective and ultimately more ethical than simply exercising institutional power. However, the answer that we usually receive when making this kind of argument is something like this. I'm not interested to discuss or find commonalities with people on the right or Trump voters or racists, et cetera. Why should I? Why should I? These are simply bad people. They have horrible ideas. And even letting them talk means that we're ceding some moral ground to these kinds of horrible ideas that in some sense we're kind of legitimizing or platforming these terrible ideas. Um, how, how would you respond to that kind of a concern? Um, or, or claim, uh, and you know, to make the case for this kind of approach that you've articulated. Sure. Uh, you know, what research shows is that the less we're exposed to other ideas, the more confident we are in our own, and almost to the point of arrogance that we can't be wrong. And so I think that we have to be very careful uh, when we're talking about other ideas. If we assume we cannot learn from someone else, then that's the first step towards dehumanizing that person. And you know, once you start dehumanizing people, wh where do you stop? Uh, and so I think we have to be very careful with that sort of perspective. Uh, second, uh, if you want, if you, here's the way I'd like to put it. Let's say you could get the political power to get whatever you want. You get 100% what you want. You, you're able to do that. You're able to use power. In this society today, 40% of the people are gonna hate what you do, which means they're gonna spend their time sabotaging you. They're going to spend their time trying to tear down whatever you've just won through political power. So how do you not do it with just political power? You have to talk to people. I am, I'm not naive. There's a certain percentage of people out there that will never be convinced. But I think we underestimate, or I think we overestimate that percentage. That uh, I, I've had the experience of talking to people, uh, you know, just personalized before 2016, I talked to several of my friends, and some of them did not vote for Trump because of the conversations that I had with them, because of the connections that I, that I made with them. Now, you know, is that the most important thing in the world? Is there other things to talk? Yes, of course. But that just shows that if we don't want people to follow that path, calling them racist 
is not, I mean, no one realistically thinks that that's going to convince them, oh yeah, I, I, I'm a racist, so I'm not going to vote for, for Trump or I'm not going to do these sort of things. Finding connections with them, being able to meet them where they're at, where you agreement, uh, you know, those are the things that, that allow people to, we got to give people a path away from that. So for me, it's like, do you really care about other people or are you just going to, I mean, you know, when I run into that sort of perspective, I, I wonder, do, do you actually care about these people that you've just sort of maligned or are they just not entities to you that you sort of pushed off? And what path do we really want to follow? So, you know, I, I, I have no, uh, I have no qualms about the path that I'm following in doing this, because as I think about those issues, the answers that I want is on how I can humanize even people that I disagree with and find commonalities. And they may never come over clearly over my side, but at least I can bring them closer. And I may learn from them. Uh, you know, I'm not so arrogant to think that I can't learn from others. What about, what about you, Ross, and how did you manage? So, so I think the anti-intellectual quip on this is you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Right. I mean, I, th I think we have an obligation to engage in the dialogue um, because you cannot hope to convince if you're not willing to have a conversation. Um, and more importantly, I think George is exactly correct. When you dehumanize someone else, um, we really are on the road, a, a really ugly road. Um, much of what we have suffered from in this country is the seeming ease with which we have dismissed humans as humans and treated them as animals or as inanimate objects. And so, I think, you know, the pot calls the kettle black. That is never the answer. I, I think we have an obligation to engage, um, to educate, uh, to explain, to articulate, and to learn, as George pointed out. Um, I, I just, I, I could not disagree more with the assumption or the assertion that um, no one is worth a conversation. I don't think there's anyone who's not worth at least a conversation. I guess one thing that out of just out of pure curiosity, uh, Roslyn, did so? Did you have a lot of? Um, did you have? Do you have Trump supporters there at your school? Um, uh, like, how do you how do you navigate? Um, I'm in South Carolina, man. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> Absolutely. Are you kidding? <laughs> yeah. So I guess how do you navigate? Um, um, how do you navigate the sort of uh, as at, at, at you know you're at, at, at the institutional level, how do you navigate some of the tensions like around 2020? Like as when we get close to elections, we usually see these kinds of really big blowups, right? Right. Um, is there anything that you do, um, sort of in the lead up to those kinds of things? If you if you can kind of um, see something coming down the down the pipe? Yeah, I, I think. Um... Ideally, yes. Um, we know that there are going to be these moments um, in my prior presidency, the HBCU presidents were all invited to the White House right after Trump um, was elected. And so we tried to take a preemptive approach. I did op-eds, I did talk, we had conversations about why that visit was important, um, why it was um, appropriate in many respects. Um, and so really headed off a lot of the sort of vitriol that out of necessity came. Um, when we were trumped at Benedict, um, while many detractors will never believe it, we had six days notice. One might think Secret Service can't scramble that quickly, but I can assure you, um, we were notified. Um, we were actually told on Friday that he would be there the following Friday and it was embargoed until Monday. So we had no lead time to get ahead of the storm that was coming. And as a result of it stood in the eye of the storm for quite a number of days. In fact, I still get hate mail, it's lovely. But, um, you know, how do you navigate that? Um, <laughs> red wine helped. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I think, you know, I'm sitting in a very unique state. So you have a Republican governor and you have titans, political titans. You have Jim Clyburn, right? The majority whip. Um, you have Lindsey Graham and Tim Scott, right? Tim Scott is one of the, uh, now one of two African-American senators in the country, right? And so um, interesting political dichotomy, right? Happening in South Carolina. And so you're on this tightrope. So I'm in historically black college that is expected to believe a certain way, think a certain way, act a certain way, walk a certain way and, and ascribe to a certain political affiliation historically or otherwise. In the middle, of, squarely in the middle of a red state, um, you know, four blocks from the Capitol in the governor's mansion. And so there were people who um, would not give me audience 
who now invite me everywhere all the time. Now, are these the people I'm necessarily courting attention from? Not necessarily, um, but it, it was a really interesting um, just, and logic goes out the window, right? To George's point about, you know, dehumanizing. So this notion that I had somehow spat on the very graves of the founders of an HBCU for not having laid my body in front of what turned out to be a 26 car motorcade. Are you kidding me? Um, it went on for miles. And so, um, you know, our kids were sheltered in place. Um, when the presidential motorcade is on the move, everyone shelters in place, whether it's Obama or Trump. The fact that Obama brought four cars when he came and Trump bought 26 just meant they were sheltered a little longer, right? But the narrative is they were imprisoned <laughs> by me in particular, right? And starved <laughs> while we waited for uh, the president to come through. So narratives have a way of getting out of control when our emotions, our feelings, our ideas, our ideologies are um, brought, to the, brought to bear. And um, I think we can't fall prey to that. I think we're better than that as humans, as intellectuals. I think we have to stand in those storms. Um, it's character building, perhaps, uh, damn near career ending, but character building in some respects. Um, and a lot of lessons. I think there are a lot of folks who never knew this little tiny HBCU existed who now write checks. Um, there are African-Americans who stopped writing checks. Um, there are, I mean, you take the good with the bad, but I think we're on the right side of history. I think my kids saw the sitting president and by the way, the, uh, the 12 democratic candidates, all 13 were on my campus in a matter of 48 hours. What an experience for a small historically black college to host 13 of the major party candidates, um, you know, in a presidential election. So whoever won, my kids were with them, right? Um, days prior to that. And I, I don't think that can be understated. The value of that experience can be understated. Uh, so the next question is, is for all panelists. Um, and um, so a lot of times when people have discussions, um, terms aren't clearly defined. So equity um, is an example of a term that's often not clearly defined in trainings, uh, sometimes in practice, definitely not usually defined in a lot of conversations about DEI that people are having, certainly on Twitter and places like that. Um, so how would each of you define the term uh, equity? What does it mean to you? Um, and uh, in addition, if diversity brings in people of diverse talents and abilities, can both diversity and equity be achieved? And uh, how, you know, how do you strike that? So I would say that they can coexist. Like, like uh, they both can be achieved and I think that here's why diversity can like can it can it like exist without us trying to en to engineer it like higher education like di like diversified you can argue that there were um, like specific like legis like legislative um, like like um, acts that that you know obviously led to that, but higher education diversified on its own because we are in a a, um, a country of I believe like people who have a desire to succeed to learn to to like to like mobilize like economically um, so. Diversity can can occur on its own. Equity, to to, to to me, like is like put like very simply, like 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 fairness, like ensuring that everyone involved within an like an institution, like like uh, and in the country, like like wherever, has access to uh, to the same opportunities. Are the outcomes going to like going to, to to be equal? Like like no, I think that would actually be um, an un like realistic like 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 goal to try to engineer outcomes for for like reasons that would honestly like like um, require an entirely different like like panel, but. 
equity to me is providing um, like equal opp like opportunity and within like like, like higher ed um, like have we like achieved that like like largely yes like totally no there are like plenty of areas um, within higher education despite all of uh, the, uh, the work that we do for diversity and for in inclusion like areas in which there are like grave inequalities qualities and so we need to pretty much go th go through pin pinpoint those specific areas and then like work towards those areas so that opportunities are equal so i think if i had to vote um two of the three off the island i would vote for inclusion right so diversity is different people from different perspectives different backgrounds people who are different. Equity is opportunity. So um, an opportunity is a relative term, right? Um, I saw the, a wonderful um, sort of argument during the height of the George Floyd demonstrations, a young woman said, this is like Monopoly, right? 400 years, 400 trips around the board, and we can't play, right? Can't acquire hotels and houses, can't buy a boardwalk. Um, and then for another hundred years after that, you let me play, but I couldn't really acquire anything. Um, we're segregated, et cetera. And if we did acquire something, you burned it down, i.e. Tulsa, happy hundredth anniversary, right? Um, and now you say to me, you're free to play, everybody's equal, why can't you catch up? Because you had a 480 year head start, right? You've acquired wealth. And so this idea of equity, is a fiction. It's very difficult for us all to sort of say today, everybody's equal and we're all in the same place. So the magic happens with inclusion, right? The magic happens in not just um, creating access to opportunity, but recognizing that there are going to be differences between and among people in capacity, in uh, ability, uh, born out of a whole host of things, generational in many instances. So we talk about, I say often my students are low wealth, but not low capacity. That's actually not true because low wealth decreases your capacity. It decreases your ability for exposure, to read good books, to have good schools, to process critical, critically, um, and, and to be exposed to thoughts and ideas that make you stronger intellectually. And so they are not competing on a level playing field with students who have come from privilege, and that's regardless of race. My children are privileged by comparison to many of the children that are on my campus. And so inclusion is an appreciation for that, that we are not equal, that we never will be equal, but there is an allowance for that um, and an opportunity to help people achieve um, their very best selves in accordance with their capacities, their abilities, um, their ideas and their contributions. And I think, so we undersell ourselves when we say diversity is the goal, not necessarily. There was a question earlier about affinity groups and HBCU is an affinity group. Right, Our students come there to have a particular type of an environment. It's a specialized affinity group college, um, but that doesn't reflect the real world. We have to prepare them to be included in a greater world. They can't stay here in this pod. And so I think you know we could do away with D and the E if we all got serious about the I, in my opinion. What do you think, George? Inclusion, if you had to pick one of the three, and then also how do you define that? Yeah, uh, I'll be honest, you know, until 15 minutes ago, I always assumed e equality and equity be the same thing. Uh, and now people are emphasizing equity. And I've not done my homework to really get at what people really mean by that. And so I'm going to let Robin and Joseph's comments on equity stand. I, you know, that, you know I, could, I could try to do the professor thing and try to sound smart on it, but I'm just not. Uh, until I do a little more reading on that, I, I really won't. But your other question is interesting, diversity, inclusion, and equity. Uh, you know, which one would I want to keep? Uh, I, you know, I'm not trying to copy Robin, but I think the inclusion is the more I think about it is the most important. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to, you know, uh, to... Uh, I think you should just choose diversity and we can argue about it. <laughs> Way more fun. <laughs> no, but I think, I, think, uh, I think for some of the reasons, you know, if we learn how to include one another, I'm not necessarily the others will come, 
but we will have a better community that we will be will be developing together. Much more so than just having diversity there. You know, yeah, you have a lot. I mean, you have a lot of diversity there, and and nothing really happens. As, and and it could be it could be it could be a negative. Uh, and making everyone equal, well, yeah, but you know, it depends on how you go about that. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think inclusion would be, you know, while we would want all three of them, I think inclusion, learning how, learning how we can include others in a respectful way would make better citizens, uh, no matter what else happens. So I, I think I'll go with the I. Okay, Joe, I'm gonna have to turn it to you now. DEI, right. pick one, go. Oh man, <laughs> this is hard. I, I think if, it, um, and I can only choose one of them, right? Only so. So I think I'm, I'm well, prioritize one, one that you, one that becomes the, the primary focus. Yeah. I, I think the, the, the one that has to be prioritized, prioritized would be diversity because it's the, it's the one, like, again, as I um, like mentioned earlier, occurs like, like naturally within our like country like now are are humans pre, pre predisposed um to uh to, to react well to to uh to to diversity like like if you're gonna um if you're gonna read like like social uh like psychological like research the answer is no i mean in group out group um hostility is very like like real uh, perceived like 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 stigma and uh, discrimination occur, you know, just uh, um, as a uh, kind of a, a bug um, within human like human nature. But with all of that said, if if diversity is the 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 priority, everyone is already like included within that. So from the from the perspective of like like of an ins, like like of an, um, of an institution, you know, let's say higher ed, I I trust that as we like we like move along through through history and you know I like I'd argue like a lot of the time currently like most like people are are capable of of responding to diversity like positively like 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 and i like like like, like um and i say that like based on my own personal experiences like like maybe that's because i've i've grown up going to school and also like worked in in uh, diverse areas so it's been easier um like for me to like uh, to see diverse individuals like interacting like positively like maybe that's a like a product of my experience but i think like again diversity is the most important because i trust the the like majority of of people today uh, to deal with it positively. Do you remember the affirmative action debates? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's, that's forced diversity, right? Um, good, bad, or otherwise, whatever your position, it didn't work out so great um, for those of us in the minority um, because the appearance or the suggestion that we mm -hmm. received something we had not earned, that we did not belong, that we were unwelcome, that we were taking something that belonged to someone else was ever present. And so while I would hope that there has been some evolution since that time, um, in terms of people's ability to receive and appreciate diversity, I think just mixing things up in and of itself does not uh, create understanding or connectivity or even mutual respect very often. And I say that from the standpoint of one who has been the minority um, a whole lot of times, because what happens, you know, the other piece of inclusion is power, right? Where does power rest? Um, and I think if you are a powerless um, minority, whether that is um, by virtue of sex or, or you know, sexual orientation or race, 
um, it's a little tougher um, to just say, yay, I'm here, we're diverse. Um, the inclusion piece of that, am I welcomed here is different. I'm here is diversity. Mm -hmm. Am I welcomed here is inclusion. And I think yeah. that you operate from a position of good faith because you're a good and decent human, but I, I yeah. am not so sure that is necessarily always the case. And, per, and perhaps I sound like, like naive and I will admit like, 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 like good possibility um, because I tend to think like, like positively uh, like for better or for worse, like, let me actually like clarify them. I am positive about like naturally occurring like diversity, like not like forced diversity. So if you like, like remove affirmative action like from the, like, 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 like the conversation, like totally, and you just assumed that if a person has the the desire to take part in an institution or a like in, like an opportunity like in my case like 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 like, like higher ed there will be a place uh, um, that's going to welcome them and i think we we like we like we like we like see that at the like the majority like of institutions are not terribly like like so, like selective I, I do believe that there's a a place within higher ed for like for everyone um like with the uh the drive to learn so like so, so again what that comes like like down to is like naturally occurring like diversity, and so I think um, like 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 that that like like type of it would be like positive, and that like like sure could be a little um, idealistic, um, but that's um, to 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 clarify because I think we are on like on a, the same page in the end. Well, it's it's interesting. So in the lack of inclusion with. In the absence of inclusion, what you often see in terms of, you can see diversity sometimes at the macro level, but not within. So for instance, at, in the United States, there's like, you know, thousands, literally thousands of schools. Um, there's religious schools, military schools, um, uh, community colleges, land grant schools. So what, 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 you, what you see sometimes for people who uh, have concern about their abilities to feel included within a particular type of institution is they tend to sort or cluster into types of institutions or spaces within an institution, you know, spaces where they'll feel um, and so you can, and so at the macro level, I guess it's that there is a college, for instance, where people who are uh, of a particular persuasion can attend, but that's different than um, but that doesn't mean that the, that that diversity across institutions is necessarily reflected within, right, within, within an institution. So you can get this kind of silos and segregation. I guess this is the, the concern that I would have with um, diversity in the absence of inclusion, personally. Uh, okay, but um, I hate to cut it off because this is like an interesting, but it, it does look like we're approaching the end of our time together this evening. Um, so let me just uh, thank the panelists for, um, joining us tonight and offering their insights. And uh, I wanna thank you all at home for um, taking the time to join us as well. And before we wrap up, let me just uh, share a few announcements. Uh, first, for those who would like to revisit tonight's conversation or share it with someone who was unable to attend, a video of the event will be uploaded to Heterodox Academy's YouTube sometime next week. Looking ahead at future events, um, HXA will be hosting an additional panel conversation next week that will dive into some of these issues um, we discussed tonight is uh, in a different way. Um, that event will take place on Wednesday, June 9th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard. To, res to register, please visit heterodoxacademy.org slash events. In the meantime, uh, HXA has many other resources on diversity, equity, and inclusion available on their website. You can visit heterod heterodoxacademy.org slash DEI to explore those. Finally, 
Uh, Heterodox Academy is still accepting nominations for the 2020 Open Inquiry Awards. This is a great way to highlight individuals, groups, and institutions who do exemplary work promoting open inquiry, viewpoint diversity, and constructive disagreement. Uh, please visit the HXA website for more information on that. Additional information about all of these resources and opportunities will be shared in a post event email for everyone who registered. Uh, thank you again um, for joining us tonight, everyone, and we uh, hope to see you again soon.